And with that, I will introduce uh, our day chair, um, who is Jim Eaton. Uh, we all know Jim Eaton. I thought I should have just kept that little green slip from last week's Mystery Member, where Jim told us all about himself. But uh, if you weren't here last week, um, we talked about Jim. The first clue was he went to Michigan State University. Uh, <laughs> and that gave it away right away. So we didn't really need to do more. A former radio announcer, right? And uh, spent his career with Wilson Learning. Uh, and he's still a longtime advisor to, not, he has a nonprofit group that he still advises. He's an avid skier and golfer, as you probably know, uh, an avid volunteer. And he's been he's been a member of City Lakes Rotary for 23 years. And uh, he's most proud of his three kids and three grandkids. So I'll turn it over to Jim. All right. I have the privilege of introducing uh, Glenn Lloyd today. Uh, as our speaker. I'll tell you a little bit more about professionally, but a little bit about his personal background. He grew up in the Washington, D.C. area in, in Virginia and Alexandria, which is really just across the river from the White House, uh, and uh, went to college at Catawba College in North Carolina, which is a I discovered is a very unique and very special school that I hadn't heard of before in Salisbury, or is that right? Uh, however, we have a connection because he also got a master's degree in public administration at Syracuse University at the Maxwell School of Public Administration in, in Syracuse. I grew up in the Finger Lakes area, only uh, 30 miles or 40 miles from Syracuse and New Syracuse University back when Jim Brown played football there. That gives you an idea how far back I go for those of you that remember Jim Brown. He ended up coming to the Twin Cities uh, uh, in 2008. Uh, he's had a number of very interesting jobs uh, that prepared him for his current role. Uh, he's married and has three pretty young kids. So he's a, a eight, seven, and five. So busyness in family and work is certainly part of a key part of his, uh, his daily uh, procedures. So with that as a sort of a general background, let me tell you a little bit more professionally about him and what he'll be talking with us today about. Um, uh, Glenn Lloyd, uh, who is the CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota, uh, founded in 1954, the Ep Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota offers services for people with epilepsy and seizures across Minnesota and Eastern North Dakota. Their programs educate, connect, and empower individuals and families throughout the epilepsy journey. Additionally, one-to-one -one support is available through their information services program for all seizure and epilepsy-related questions. As CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota, Glenn has demonstrated a strong commitment to racial equity and public health, particularly in serving marginalized individuals in the community. In 2022, the Bloomington-based organization secured passage of the Seizure Smart Schools legislation, which requires all Minnesota public and private schools to receive seizure training. Lloyd has played a pivotal role in the recent fundraising success in that, that organization's fundraising success. Last year, the organization achieved its highest ever fundraising, and Lloyd has since surpassed the goal in 2023, including a five million single million dollar single gift and substantial increases in donations across the board. He has also spearheaded the mission outcomes of the team uh, of, of the organization, ensuring that individual community organizers can help their respective communities navigate the challenges and needs associated with epilepsy or seizures. With that as the backdrop, I'd like to introduce you to Glenn Floyd, Lloyd, and welcome to City of Lakes Rotary. Thanks so much, John. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got it from him. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to be with you this morning. I was with your colleagues in Chaska uh, about three months ago and really enjoyed the chance to connect and really appreciate an opportunity to come talk about the really important work 
happening at the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. Jim didn't mention, but uh, I celebrated my move to Minnesota anniversary this earlier this month. Uh, on September 5th, 2006, I moved to Northfield, Minnesota. Uh, and I thought I would only be here for a couple of years. For a kid on the East Coast, I thought, well, Minnesota, it seems really nice. They have a great airport, and that chicken wild rice soup is just so good. I'll, I'll give it a try. I married a Minnesotan, so now I'm Minnesotan. Uh, <laughs> so glad to be here and talk about the work happening at the foundation. I, I work with uh, excellent professionals who come from a public health background, social services, uh, as well as uh, particularly folks that are really interested in living in community and connecting with one of our most chronic diseases that is rarely talked about. And so today I want to raise your attention to epilepsy as a public health issue. Uh, one of the key things of running through this discussion is to just highlight there are a number of things that I'm going to have to cover quickly. Uh, when you want to learn more, epilepsyfoundation.org is a great place to turn. If you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one conversation with myself or someone from our staff, you hear something interesting that connects with your work, please reach out. I have my business card with me today. It's rare. I don't carry them. Uh, as you can imagine, I just say, well, let's collect, connect on LinkedIn. Uh, but I brought my business card for anybody that wants to have that discussion. So we'll talk about the foundation. We'll talk about seizures and epilepsy, uh, what you should know about it if you don't know about it personally. Uh, oftentimes, if you've seen a febrile seizure or have seen one, seen someone have a seizure or know someone with epilepsy, uh, you have greater lived experience uh, than uh, you probably even talk about. And that's something that we want to continue to move forward is making it a public health issue, meaning we have to talk about it. Then I want to talk about some of the population facts because, frankly, they're quite shocking and something you should be thinking about as a citizen of Minnesota, which is how we can continue to support uh, our neighbors who are on the margins of society and we can do something about their journey in our state. So epilepsy has been declared a public health problem by the CDC. The CDC has been investing in their population health team in epilepsy research and advancing the public health conversation uh, since the late 1990s. Uh, so we are now nearly 25 years of the CDC investing in research, public health research around the impacts of epilepsy in community. The key things that you should know is, is that not only is the seizure of particular focus when living with epilepsy, but there's additional layers of stigma, uh, huge gaps in transportation uh, due to the fact that once someone has a seizure, they are ineligible to drive. Uh, I can talk a little bit more about that, but I'll say we live in a state that is incredibly progressive on looking at the medical research and then making good public policy. Uh, in the state of Minnesota, uh, you only have to go three months of restrictions uh, from being able to drive clear of a seizure. However, in every state that touches us, it is 12 months. So you can imagine that when it's a population living with epilepsy that are mostly adults and working, often uh, translated in the upper Midwest is you better get in your car and drive. Uh, this is a real challenge in the community. To layer on top of that is also the isolation that comes from the anxiety of not knowing when you will have a seizure. And so oftentimes we find folks who are living with epilepsy have deep concerns about where they go and who they go with. Uh, and if you've ever experienced uh, being with someone who maybe has a seizure a year, uh, you often hear them talk about, well, maybe not there. Or, well, I'll go with that person because they know how to respond to the seizure. They won't tell you that they're living with epilepsy. They'll already be mapping out another way to tell you that they are managing a hidden disability and want to be sure that they feel comfortable in the settings that they need to move around in. The other things that I think are important to highlight here is that uh, epilepsy is one of the top 10 chronic diseases in America. That may catch you by surprise. Uh, this is on the same list as asthma, diabetes, uh, and, and epilepsy, more interesting, is probably the only one that has a, a high level of discrimination based around uh, old wives' tales, horrible religious uh, bigotry related to the condition because we couldn't see what was going on in the brain and understand it for millennia. And so we wrote stories about what was happening inside of people's bodies. We've come to find out exactly what is happening. And that is where we think we're seeing a revolution. 
of elevating this to a public health issue. The final thing I'll highlight that the CDC really works on is trying to translate for the community, what's the scale of our challenges and what are we up against? To that point, oh, um, there are more than 3.4 million Americans living with epilepsy. Uh, that's 1% of the population for easy math, 1%. Uh, when you think about that 1%, that is the active military in the U.S., for comparison. So in every state, in every community where there are more than 100 people, someone's living with epilepsy. And interesting enough, if there are less than 100 people in that community, they probably have epilepsy because they're in a rural community that has poor access to health care. And so oftentimes people struggle with seizures when they don't have access to specialty care and what that looks like. Now, 70% of the population that are living with epilepsy have seizure control, meaning they are taking some level of medication or treatment strategy that is eliminating their daily concern of when a seizure may happen. However, the anxiety associated with a chronic disease never leaves them. And so as I talked about that management, something that you will see in communities with seizure control is a particular concern about what can unfold when and where for the off chance that you have a seizure. Uh, one personal story, and it's a pretty close friend of mine, uh, she didn't have seizures for years. Uh, and the one time she had a seizure, she was in the car uh, putting her uh, at the time, one-year-old child in the car seat had gotten in to start to drive, put the car in reverse, and had a seizure. Her husband was returning home to see the car uh, with the lights, uh, you know, in reverse, but could tell something was wrong. Sadly, the car doors were locked because that's what happens when you put a car in reverse. Uh, he had to jump through the sunroof. I tell you that story to highlight this is what a breakthrough seizure can look like, unexpected in everyday circumstances. So how could we ever imagine folks to walk through with high levels of confidence that they're going to have a normal everyday life every day when you don't know where the seizure may come? Now, for that seizure control group, a couple things that I'll say out loud. Uh, this is all walks of life, rich, poor, black, white, tall, short. There is no particular signal about why our populations have seizures. And so it's important to know that you know somebody with epilepsy. You just may not know they have epilepsy. It's like disclosing that you have high blood pressure. Who walks around talking about their high blood pressure unless they're really concerned that something's going to unfold? Nobody. Same thing when you're in this control group. And so one of the things we often talk about for folks in the room who are impacted by epilepsy is you are very much a part of this community as you have seizure control, because I know you're moving around in this world with a ton of anxiety, hoping that you don't have a seizure in public because you fear of what the response would be. That is also why the foundation exists, is to open up and have conversations with every person impacted by epilepsy because the anxiety and the concern never leaves our population. Now, for the 30% that are moving through the world and won't know a year, a month, a day, an hour, or a minute without a seizure, and that's the range of what it means to have intractable epilepsy, is that you are constantly reimagining how to manage your life. Oftentimes, caregivers find themselves in this population uh, to be carrying an immense amount of stress because the management associated with epilepsy isn't only associated with the seizures. Uh, I, I had a, a recent board member tell me the story that they were traveling to Europe. They were incredibly excited to travel to Europe. You know, it's a trip of a lifetime. I heard your trip. You're headed to Italy. I hope you have a great time and have a great ride. They were going very similarly to that part of Europe. And, and what unfolded for them was, was that they then had to answer the question of which medication time should they keep to? Is it Minnesota time or should I take the medication? in Europe time. Often there are few answers about how to actually go live life with epilepsy that are pretty basic decisions. Like, I wanna see the world, but I am in a different time zone, what should we do? 
These are the questions that are showing up at the foundation and we see sincerely being lived out in our community. Now, a couple of high level pieces of information. Who has epilepsy, Glenn, the most? Who has the onset of seizures and at what age? So oftentimes people know that children under the age of five are our highest prevalent population to have a seizure. Okay, so under five, it's up to 5% of the population of children will have a seizure. Okay, and about, uh, it, it's still being studied, but probably out of that group, then there is about 10% of that population who will have epilepsy. Okay, so uh, having a seizure, very prominent with children and then 65 and older. Oftentimes in the 65 over population, it's linked to some other condition that someone has a seizure. Uh, I've I had a good friend, they were concerned that uh, his father, who is now in his 80s, was having seizures and believed to have epilepsy. No, it was linked to an underlying health condition. So seizures both point to a specific condition like epilepsy, or it could be pointing to other issues uh, like stroke uh, and other things associated with aging, traumatic brain injury, any level of brain injury or bleeding on the brain. You heard in my bio that there's been a particular focus on racial equity in our work. Uh, I will tell you that it is also a, uh, a more intersectional truth in epilepsy. Uh, it's not only the fact that black and brown people have had horrible health care in America. We all know that. Let's not kid ourselves. That's not a hard uh, story to understand. The more nuanced understanding is, is it actually matters where you live with epilepsy. So if you live in the Twin Cities today, you have the most specialists in neurology per capita than any other place in the U.S. There are more, it's my favorite word, epileptologists in the, yes, can practice that one, it's amazing. We have more epileptologists in the state of Minnesota, in the Twin Cities and Rochester area per capita than any other place in the world, actually, when you go narrowly. And so there's a lot of specialty care available in the state of Minnesota. And sadly, we don't have good statewide data on how many people are getting to a specialist because our Minnesota Department of Health doesn't study it. Not yet, anyway. The other elements that play out are we know that there are huge impacts for black and brown communities around who dies from epilepsy. And this is oftentimes the most sobering part of what I have to share with you is, is that epilepsy can take lives. We have many patients and families, and sadly, surviving families, who tell us no one ever told them that their loved one could die from a seizure. People do. Uh, it is about one in 1,000 for people who have uncontrolled seizures. But more concerning for our population is one in 150 of 18 to 39 year olds with uncontrolled seizures will die. So nine times the risk at a time when you're living your most independent life, expected to be flourishing and developing in other ways. And so as we have thought about a direction forward as a foundation in changing our society and our policy ecosystem in the state, it's particularly been focused on addressing sudden unexpected death in epilepsy and particularly for young adults. Uh, this is one of the leading causes of death, obviously followed uh, by suicide and then gun violence. The other pieces that I'll highlight is, is that I live in Mankato. Uh, so if you did the math about what time I woke up, I'm so glad to be here. I have to wake up early. That should warn a happy buck from all of you that I am this, this spry and eager uh, early in the morning. The important piece to know is, is that in rural communities, disability is at a higher level, as I told you, than in urban settings. It's just 15% to 9%, simply based around where you live. So access to care, transportation, level of social services, ability to connect with someone one-to-one -one is something that we have been focused on as a foundation for more than a decade, which is we have outreach managers that are based all throughout the state of Minnesota. We decided that it wasn't good enough to be serving the greater Twin Cities when we know that the need is statewide, reaching all the way up to the range, all the way out uh, towards South Dakota. Finally, I do wanna highlight this 2022 report that the CDC uh, did on epilepsy and just highlight 
that the poverty level is higher in the epilepsy community. The challenges of being an adult with epilepsy, where it may be <laughs> limits your ability uh, to get gainful employment and what that means, as well as Medicaid is used more in this population than in other any other disease state. Three times more likely to be on Medicaid as an adult in epilepsy. Why? Because epilepsy can be qualified under Social Security disability as a disability, as well as range to not being a disability, but limiting your capacity to earn an income. And so we see a lot of poverty in our community. Uh, and then poor quality of life outcomes, particularly linked to isolation and anxiety, means that folks aren't living a full and meaningful life. Quickly, I look good. That's the leading point. Uh, I hate this slide. This is when I was a volunteer. This is not when I was on staff. Uh, listen, we're working to build communities where no one journeys through epilepsy. You heard a lot of us talking about our commitment to one-on-one -on -one support, as well as policy change that was highlighted in my bio. Uh, we support people that you would know and meet. Uh, so when you connect with someone that says, oh, I'm living with epilepsy, when you say, oh, I heard the guy from the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota, and they say, oh, I'm living with epilepsy, or my brother is, or my sister is, uh, or my mom is, or my dad is, or yeah, my niece has epilepsy. You say, have you connected with the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota? Because they can talk with you one-on-one -on -one confidentially and have meaningful conversations. He told me that oftentimes people living with epilepsy have a ton of anxiety and don't know where to turn to talk about that. That's what we do at the foundation, all across the state, in every community, even in places like Gibbon, Minnesota. We uh, after uh, connect groups, ways for others who are impacted by epilepsy to connect with one another. Oftentimes we see a lot of power uh, in the conversations that people have. And then our camp program, Camp Oz is the program. It is a, an amazing camp experience out of Camp St. Croix, our partner at the YMCA. We've been doing it for 40 years. So we're really proud to have an anonymous donor, you may have heard, give a $5 million gift to endow our camp, that it will always be available. Uh, to any family impacted by epilepsy. So children have the best week of their life, not taking a shower, trying new things, making friends and then frenemies and then being friends again. All of that happens at our camp while providing the most medically safe experience outside of someone's own home. Seizures, sudden brief activity in the brain. Think of like a thunderstorm. Sometimes they can be short. Sometimes they can last, sometimes they crackle a little, sometimes they have big booms. That's a seizure in the brain. Epilepsy is then the condition of unpro unprovoked seizures that are recurring. If you have two or more seizures, it's a very broad definition. If you have two or more seizures, you've had, you have epilepsy, right? But unprovoked, as in pointing to the fact that as you look at the cascading uh, visuals of what the brain looks like, uh, a regular operating brain without seizures is uh, pretty standard in its wavelengths. When you have a seizure that happens in one part of the brain called a focal seizure, it triggers in one area and may impact another part. Uh, then there are generalized seizures. These are what you know as full-blown seizures, grand mal seizures, generalized tonic-clonics. You pick whichever term you like. The answer is it's a full-body seizure, and you'll never forget the time you see one. Okay, it can be someone seizing on the ground with their muscles contracting, or they are literally staring at you for 10 seconds and not being able to move, communicate, uh, and they may simply be standing and looking right at you. These are some of the leading causes that we do know about in epilepsy. And the more shocking thing is, is that there's so much more we don't know. For 60 to 70 percent of seizures, we don't know the cause. We don't know how or why someone is having a seizure. These are all the options. Oftentimes, medications is at the forefront of managing seizures. Uh, it is a sobering message to say out loud. Uh, but pharmaceutical companies get a take a lot of flack in a lot of health conditions. In epilepsy, there is no seizure control without a pharmaceutical drug. Period. Full stop. Then you layer in the fact that there are now more surgical options. Once again, we have amazing neurosurgery here in the state, University of Minnesota, Minnesota Epilepsy Group, and the Mayo Clinic all offer 
uh, dozens of doctors who are neurosurgeons uh, that are particularly focused in epilepsy, as well as neuromodulation, thanks to companies like Medtronic, uh, have made advances in this space. Oftentimes, diet, if you've heard of the ketogenic diet, it is a great supplement to decreasing risk of seizures, but it is not a panacea to be on the ketogenic diet alone. Lastly, uh, this this slide might be outdated now in the state of Minnesota, but uh, uh, actually it's not, frankly, because medical cannabis uh, is proven uh, to decrease seizures. Sadly, until the FDA and the federal government make a different declaration, people are paying out of pocket for medical cannabis. Uh, and then I layered in the fact that many people in our community are poor. This is an inequity and a barrier to better care. Lastly, I wanted to end on the slide of our seizure safety and alert devices. Actually, thanks to our continued advocacy, this year our legislator and our governor supported uh, getting these covered under Medicaid. So before this year, there was no state in the U.S. that covered seizure alert systems that decreased the risk of dying from a seizure. No state. I want to repeat that. No state had covered this under their Medicaid coverage, even though in Medicaid, there are th three times as many people living with epilepsy utilizing Medicaid. Proud to say in our state, we're the first state in America to get FDA approved seizure detection devices covered under Medicaid. This is a big win. Many states are coming to us and asked how we did it. The truth of the matter is we did it with community. So as I wrap up, I'll just say, stay safe side. You went to the state fair, you saw our booth, Be Seizure Smart, it's pretty, clear and quick, and so I'm going to give it to you in 10 seconds. If you believe someone's having a seizure, call 911. Secondly, stay with them. They won't know what's happening. Reminder, it's a thunderstorm in the brain. They, they aren't comprehending what has taken place, so stay with them through the seizure. Most seizures last for two to three minutes. You've already called 911. Uh, some of the more catastrophic seizures can last 30 minutes to an hour. If you've read the book, uh, When the Spirit Catches You, You Fall Down, uh, this is really chronicled. It's a powerful story. Uh, if you're concerned about their safety, as in they are going or nearing steps, get in between them and the steps. Once again, we don't want you to restrain them. Actually, it increases risk of injury to the person if you try to restrain them. And, and so oftentimes the body has these systems, kind of these sonic systems that are happening. Uh, if you can put yourself in the way of danger, it helps a ton. And then said, uh, if you're concerned about their head or them biting, you see them bleeding, it's probably because they bit, bit their tongue. Uh, we wanna make sure that you put something under their head, something soft, a jacket, even your leg. Uh, we've seen people lay right beside them and slide their leg underneath to limit any more head injury. Finally, turn them on their side. Don't put anything in their mouth. If you're concerned about their breathing, turn them on their side. Uh, they won't aspirate and that's the really key point. I know I used up all my time, so thank you for having me. Uh, Glenn, can you stay around uh, for a few minutes? Because normally we do have some Q&A, but we also honor our 8.30 uh, ending. So uh, for those of you that do have some questions, I, th I think I can speak for everybody. We will, Most of us knew about epilepsy, but we didn't know about it. <laughs> and I think it has been a great contribution for sharing what you did about this very important and sad disease that's we're also take pride in Minnesota that we do more than most states that's in support of it. So thank you. Uh, one of the guests, uh, one of the features of our guests is that we uh, want to leave you a memento of joining us. It's a book that uh, we present to a child in an, uh, through an organization called Way to Grow. We'd like you to assign this and as a signature and uh, and have a, a, a memory for for your time with us. And also, you'll find in here a bookmark from uh, Haiti, which uh, reflects a, a, a relationship we have with Haiti Outreach, which works in the in the country of Haiti, primarily in water uh, reclamation for communities. So that that's something you can add to your uh, reading list uh, for. It. So let's uh, close with a warm uh, appreciation for our guest, Glenn Lloyd.
Well, I think Glenn gets they came farthest for the meeting award, other than maybe Bob, who also came for this for the meeting awards. So, uh, pardon? Brazil, yeah, Carol, the big winner, yes. <laughs> so thank you everybody for being here. I wanna especially thank um, Glenn for coming and speaking to us this morning. Christine for getting up early to be our greeter. Uh, Bill Klein for that wonderful reflection. Uh, Meg for using her skill as the happy buck collector. <laughs> uh, Jim for being our day chair and for hosting the um, golf outing. Uh, Greg and Scott doing our tech work. Thank you both very much. And Steve, the microphone person. So, uh, and uh, Carol for coming and our new members, especially delighted to have you here, Jasmina and Sydney. So with that, have a great Rotary Week. <laughs>